Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Conversations with Harsh. Today, we have one of the top 100 global mortgage professionals across Canada. Uh, she was awarded the Mortgage Broker of the Year for 2023, and she is a member of the Forbes Finance Council. Her team till date has funded over $1.5 billion in Canadian mortgages. She is a best-selling author for Canadian Investor Financing and the founder of Canadian Top brokerage that works with investors streetwise mortgages and she has just started an arm which is a consulting arm for real estate advisory where she helps investors with their investments uh, and advises on the investments so welcome dahlia bersom thank you harsh thank you very much we would like to know more about your journey like how has it been you have been long in the industry and 1.5 billion in mortgages funded till date so when you came to canada you were born here you i assume you were not born here you came here right as a kid or maybe in school so yeah let's talk about your journey how how has your journey been in canada how long have you been here and what made you join the mortgage industry uh, i came to canada when i was 18 i wasn't born in canada we immigrated to canada and i came here uh, at the age of 18 or 19 and i actually started in uh, computers i was a computer programmer uh, that's uh -huh. I'm a graduate of computer science with uh, an accounting degree. So I started in computers. It was cool at the time. And I started with the banks. And uh, I spent about 15 years with the banks before I switched over to the mortgage industry. And in that journey, I touched everything from technology to personal and commercial banking to marketing to business strategy. And then my last experience was uh, with, with uh, Bimo Nesbitt Burns, actually, uh, in wealth management. And oh, wow. I made the leap to mortgage brokerage. Oh, wow. and when was that? That was in 2011. Uh, okay, so you have almost 12 years, 12 completed years in mortgage industry. That's right, yes. Wow. And so now you run a team, Streetwise Mortgages, right? So first you, I, I guess you started as a mortgage uh, agent, then you became a broker, and then you opened your own brokerage, right? Now, how many, how many employees or like agents do you have? I don't have agents. I have a team and they're all employees, uh, but they're all licensed and they're all together we're 15 right now wow wow and when when did you start streetwise mortgages so formally 2016 okay so that's that's quite a big achievement like in uh seven years uh, you have been you have funded like 1.5 billion dollars for investors across canada uh, across ontario so i guess you only fund in ontario or you work across canada well, we work across Canada. We work in Ontario, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Alberta, and British Columbia. So that's almost entire Canada. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we expanded uh, outside of Ontario about a year ago. That's that's great. So so. Uh... When an investor comes to Streetwise Mortgages, right? Uh, you have some special products for investors. You help them guide through their decisions or how does it work? Like how, how, how does Streetwise Mortgages function as a brokerage helping investors prosper in their wealth or building their wealth through investments in real estate? Yeah, we have a very different operating philosophy from uh, a typical mortgage brokerage. Uh, because of my background in wealth management and yes. uh, financial planning i when i came to this industry i kind of combined the philosophies of financial planning with mortgage uh, funding and i realized early on that real estate investors need a financing plan a financing roadmap to help them get to where they want to get it's not just about funding the property that they're looking to buy now but it's more about tell me how i'm going to structure money to build a portfolio, whatever portfolio I'm looking to build. So yes. what, we do, what we do here is we work with investors across their journey. We have investors who are starting out, maybe they're just, they own their home and they're getting into first property. Some investors have touched real estate and got a slip of what it is and now they wanna do two more. And then some say, you know what, this real estate thing is awesome. I wanna actually build a portfolio. And then you get the investor who build a portfolio and they are scaling to apartment buildings and developments and, you know, Know, like yes. a more complicated type of asset classes so we support investors across their journey and at the end of the day what we do is we help them develop a financing roadmap we actually sit down with everybody talk about what they're looking to achieve where they are we look at um, their money sources 
we have access to private, alternative, commercial, A money, and we understand how to structure joint ventures. So what we do is help the, the investor develop a financing plan as to how they're gonna get from where they are right now to where they wanna be. And we uh, plan, you know, three, four properties at a time. And then once they hit their milestone, we leap to the next, next one. Platform. Okay. We're more uh, forward thinking. We, we think forward versus just right now. Which is which is actually required and which is what investors need. Because, because saying that I am an investor looks good, but really if they don't understand the financing aspect of it, which is the major part, it really doesn't make sense of calling someone an investor, right? And that's where you and your team come in and people like you mortgage brokers who help and work with investors, they come in. This is really great because not every, uh, I have not seen many mortgage brokers work with investors. They do not specialize in investors, right? They'll say, okay, give me the five, they'll get the funding. I'm not saying they'll not be, but there is no plan. There's just one property, one file, and the funding is done. We what actually give our investors a plan. We actually yes. give them a plan called the financing roadmap. Yeah, and and I, I think that's that's what the major difference is, right? And that's how people would benefit working with you. Now, coming from uh, like from a starting, the very first uh, investor, they just own a primary home, they don't have any investments, or sometimes they don't even own that, they're renting, and they do not have the available funds to buy the investment. Yes. Would it be the right client for you? Can you help them build out a plan and then possibly purchase a smaller investment and then move on to the bigger ones? Yes, absolutely. We work with investors regardless of where they are at their investment journey, and we meet them where they are. So someone who is starting out has yes. limited funds, okay? We can actually help them tap into what we call more creative sources of funds. So uh, gifted down payment, uh, maybe uh, a, an unsecured loan, and it may make sense if we uh, take the cost of it into account and it can still allow them to get to where they wanna get and the property covers, that's an option. And um, RSPs, obviously, for a first-time home buyer is an option because some can buy a property, they can rent a part of it, and it's still a residence, but with a rental component. And then uh, you've got some of the creative, creative uh, side of financing, which is, can I negotiate a vendor take-back or get a private mortgage with a vendor take-back second? My point is, there are options for everybody, and we know what financing methods to use depending on where you are on your journey. I find sometimes investors jump at certain tools ahead of time or don't know how to use that financing tool the right way, but that's where we come in and, and guide the investor. Yes, absolutely. So audience, uh, whoever is listening and who will be listening and viewing this show, this is what is actually required when you work with a mortgage broker who specializes with investors, right? It's not just funding that particular property, it's funding and creating a plan which will move you ahead. Right now, you're just maybe focused on that one fourplex, fiveplex, but what about getting 100 units in place? Mm -hmm. So that's that's where Dahlia and her team comes in, right? Okay, now now there's a new talk about in the market about on the, especially on the commercial uh, multifamily side. So turning the tables like the MLI Select. In MLI Select, I know there are like four affordability, uh, accessibility, and then the environment or- uh, Energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, yes. So yeah, talk to us about that. Like how good is that program? Advantages, disadvantages, like, and I know you you kind of specialize in that kind of piece as well, right? Yes. Uh, I've seen you speak on that, so that's where it's coming from. Yes, so in a nutshell, the yes. MLI Select program is considered one of the best programs on the street for financing commercial properties. Uh, that is five units and above. And really what it does for an investor is it offers the opportunity to um, buy or refinance with a higher loan to value. The program can go up to 95%, okay? Oh. You can get up to an extended uh, amortization of 50 years. And uh, the cost of money is cheaper. And typically properties qualify for larger loan amounts under that type of money. Now, 
it was launched to support housing and the way investors qualify for such a program is by doing things that get them higher points with CMHC. So there are three buckets, as you said, Harsh. There is affordability, yes. there is a scale that says if you keep X number of the units in a building uh, below what they call the median 30% of the median mark a uh, median um, rent in that market you get x number of points if you keep more units you get more points and so on so that's affordability and then energy efficiency is all about um, things you're doing to the building that will help improve energy efficiency obviously so yes. we have rules around uh, what that looks like for a new building and they have rules for what that looks like for an existing building that you're renovating and again it's a scale, you know, you get yes. a number of points if you do this, you get more points if you do this and so on, up to a hundred points. And then accessibility, they also have guidelines on what they want to see. So they want to make sure, obviously, a building is more accessible on certain posts. So the investor has the option to play in any of these sandboxes. And the more points they accumulate, the more benefits they get, essentially, is what it is. What I can tell you about this program is that in major markets, I am seeing more investors utilize the energy efficiency model because in major markets, you know, investors typically want to benefit from the increasing rents in these yes. major centers. Uh, they don't play much on affordability because if, if you want to uh, get points on the affordability component, you have to keep the rents affordable for 10 years. And what do we know about apartment buildings? That rents impact your net operating income, which impacts the yes. value, right? So in wow. this case, I see more investors use the energy efficiency sandbox, and you can get up to 100 points there, or they combine that with a little bit of affordability, maybe for smaller units, like a, uh, the one bedrooms or the, yes. uh, the, the, the studios, not the two bedrooms and the three bedrooms, right? No. In, in more remote markets, I am seeing more of the affordability uh, play. So that's my general observation. But overall, it's a great program, um, and you know, uh, investors should utilize it to the maximum possible right now. Yes, and uh, we also see that many of the investors are inclined towards that. So now for the affordability, you said there are limits that out of like 100% of the tenants, this number should be affordable housing or allocated for that affordable rent. I would say, right? 80%. So maximum scale is 80% of the units need to be below 30% of the median renter's income in the area. So let's say we're talking about Edmonton. See yes. issues a sheet, uh, it's on their website. If you search for the median renter's income on the CMHC website, a sheet will come up. It will show you city by city um, what that number is. So let's say in one market it is 50,000. So we take 30% of that 50,000, and that's the number uh, divided by 12. Yes. And our rent roll has to be um, com compared to that. So if 40% are below that number, that gives you X number of points. If more than 40%, you get more points. If 80%, you get the highest points, that's the 100 points. But you have to maintain that for 10 years. It doesn't mean that you cannot turn tenants, you can, but every year on commercial deals, as you and I know, Yes. What's called an annual review. It's yes. Residential, right? Residential. Yep. You sign this approval, and <laughs> you know you're making your payments. The, yes. the next time you're going to hear from the lender is when the renewal comes up, and you need to pick a term. Commercial yes. is different. It's every year they do. Yes. An, they need to see on an annual basis for ten years that you're keeping, you're still staying within that rule that eighty percent of the units that you said you're going to commit to are below the median thirty percent of the median rental state, which obviously puts a cap on your value for for that period. Like I kind of had an idea about like yeah, there are some. Uh, percentages of that like you said 30 percent 40 percent but i was not aware that that needs to be maintained for 10 years that's a long time on the affordability only it doesn't mean that yes. you need to get a 10 years mortgage term we can still yep. get a five years but in terms of adhering to that commitment yeah and which is which is really hard especially in the major markets yeah maybe in the secondary tertiary markets may be possible but i might not go for affordability <laughs> maybe at 10 percent <laughs> just yeah. to get some benefit but yeah okay and also someone was telling me like the terms are really strict with mli select 
where and you can like five year or ten year and you can break it in between that's always the case harsh with cmhc cmhc only offers you a five-year fixed and a ten-year fixed whether it's mli or yep. under a regular program it's always the case and it's not not easy to uh, break and this is why I, I advise clients not to jump into a CMHC until they've stabilized the building or yes. if they're prepared not to touch that mortgage. Yes. The term. So now moving on, uh, not uh, from the MLI select, but still on the CMHC, I want to talk a little bit about mortgage assumptions. Nowadays, we're seeing a lot of mortgage assumption deals coming out. Some have three years, some have seven years left in their mortgage assumptions. So any guidance or wisdom on that, like if somebody is getting into a mortgage assumption deal, what are what does CMHC look for? Because I know there, there's a fee, there's a there's a requalification kind of thing, and there are covenants that that need to be either assumed or brought in new. So and what what are your thoughts on that that part? Because there are a lot, like eighty percent of the deals on the market, especially the multifamily, they are now coming as acquisition uh, assumable mortgages. Yes, you're absolutely right. I was just working on a sixteen unit deal myself, and it had an assumable CMHC mortgage at two point something. <laughs> so, uh, here is what I can tell you about the mortgage assumptions on a commercial deal with CMHC. If you take the building's current financials, right? Yes. Current financial expense, and you try to figure out how much loan does it qualify for today at today's rates with CMHC, I guarantee you that that loan is going to be less than what that assumable mortgage is on the building right now. Because back at the time when that owner arranged a CMHC mortgage, the loans were, the, the rates were much lower and the building could afford a bigger loan. So yes. to your benefit to assume that mortgage, you're going to get a bigger loan by assuming. Okay. How process work well qualification is in this case is really about the personal guarantees and the what they call the sponsors the sponsors are the applicants on the market so what CMHC wants to see is that the applicants have at least 25 percent net worth of oh, the consumable loan and yes. their credit is 650 or more and if they're taking on this mortgage what are their experience in managing such a building? Do they have someone on their team or is there someone that they're hiring to manage such an asset? Because at the end of the day, that is a risk to CMHC and to the lender. They're not gonna go and rerun the numbers and say, oh, but today this building doesn't qualify for this much mortgage, so we're gonna cut it down. That's not how it works. Really, it's about the strength of the applicant. So as an investor, you wanna show your best resume. You wanna obviously have, uh, if you're in a, if you're setting up a corporation to buy it, the directors are the applicants. If it's a GPLP, then the general partners are the applicants. You want to show your best resume. You want to have the best net worth, 25% at least, and uh, the credit has to uh, be there. And then you can assume the mortgage. But as you assume this mortgage, recognize what you're stepping into. Because if the term doesn't expire until 2027 or whatever that is, mm -hmm. just don't assume that you're going to be able to break it and if you're going to plan renovations on the building and you want to tap into that equity while that term is still active a lot of lenders will not let you tap into that equity behind cmhc if the equity takeout is less than a million dollars it becomes very challenging step into these things understanding what are the pros what are the cons and that's really what you need to, to keep in mind when it comes to assumptions. But how fairly easy or difficult is the process? So let's say credit score is met. Uh, you have some person who can be a part of the GP or anybody, right? The, like the director of the company who has the net worth. And then you have property management company or you have the experience of managing these kind of assets. How yes. hard or difficult? Yeah. It's not overly difficult, but it takes a back seat, I find, because it's not new business for CMHC, like any business. Yes. Deals that are coming through the door is new business and yes. there's resources. But this, they already own this mortgage. They just need to, to go through the admin work to change who is going to pay them. So yes. I just find that the process takes longer 
as a result of that. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard like sometimes it's taking nowadays like seven to nine months somewhere around that time frame for the mortgage assumption. Yes. And now they're also not allowing the equity takeout, like just you said, to get paid back to the investors. There are rules. There are rules around it. Here, here is an idea about mortgage assumption that is not for everybody, but I don't think people know about it. To cut down the cycle with CMC, so you can keep the seller as the guarantor on the mortgage and you can step into the deal and then transition the guarantees later on so this way it does cut down the closing cycle some lenders allow that uh, but obviously you don't want to you know join hips with someone you don't know that is yes a big fan of that but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too many people know about that. Oh, that's that's a good insight. Thank you. That's really a good insight. So just have the seller, okay, keep the covenants till now. We'll we'll do it after like six months after we close or maybe a year after, right? Yeah, but the seller has to be willing to do it and the lender yes. has to be okay with it. Yes, yes. Okay, now coming coming to, well, let's talk a little bit about the real estate advisory, the Streetwise Wealth that you created and which is fairly new. So let us talk like, what do you do in that side of the business that you're helping investors? Again, I believe it's not mortgage, like mortgage is Streetwise mortgages, but in this one, is this the planning advisory? What is it? Yes, so uh, Streetwise Wealth has been around for a year now almost. And what, what it is about is helping clients utilize real estate as an asset to achieve their goals. So what do I mean by that? Clients come to us and say, Dahlia, I'd like to uh, build a portfolio of properties that will help me quit my job in five years. And I want to earn $5,000 a month and that's what I'm comfortable with. So what we do in that side of the business, is we bring in a financial planner, bring in what we call a real estate uh, advisor. Typically it's a realtor who is not just transaction focused, but really knows the market inside out. And yes. we bring in someone from our team on the financing side and we bring in, you know, uh, a tax person and we bring in a, an insurance person and we help put together a comprehensive plan that basically translates this idea of how can I get $10,000 or $5,000 in five years from a real estate portfolio. So we come forward with a plan that advises the client of the best asset class they invest in in real estate, the best strategy we can connect them with people who can help them implement. We map out the money sources to get them there and we show them, you know, through uh, modeling and analysis, that's where the financial planner comes in and the tax person comes in, how it's gonna look like in the future. So it's more of a, a financial planning for real estate investors, put it that way. And it's a fee for service. It's not uh, like streetwise mortgages, it's it's more transactional. This is, although here we do financing plans, but we take the financing plans, put them into the financial real estate plan. We plug what we do here into yes. this. Yes. What we do at streetwise mortgages is money planning. What yes. we do is goals planning and how can we get you there utilizing the right strategies and assets in real estate and putting the puzzle together by bringing several professionals to make it happen. That's really a good service. I don't know if anybody else does that. No, nobody does that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, uh, it's, yeah. Complex. it's complex. It's uh, complex. That The reason why it's not out there is because it's complex and it's very intense in terms of modeling. There is risk assessment, there is modeling, there is input from different advisors to put this plan together and there are sometimes iterations oh you know what yeah but i want to pay my kids this much when they go to school and sorry when they go to university can you incorporate that into my plan okay now we have to rejuggle certain things like it's 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 irritating. I don't know what the word is. Iteration. You know, I, yes, thank you. Yeah. To, to, to put that plan together. Wow, that's that's a really good service. I'd like to do that sometime too. <laughs> and uh, we, we, um, we're we going to be opening it up uh, again soon for new clients. We're at capacity right now. And I, oh, okay. I'm a big believer that, you know, I want to provide quality service and quality advice. So there are times where I have to say, you know what, we're at capacity, come back later to serve you. We're scaling that business up, obviously. So we're working okay. on that. All right, perfect. And back to the mortgages side. What kind of mortgages uh, do you do? I know residential, commercial, and commercial. What kind of, uh, are there any products that, uh, or any fundings for any kind of deals that you don't do or you do anything? Like some people don't do construction. Some people only do construction. Okay, so we do, we are a hub of money for real state investors who are building portfolios using uh, residential, which is one to four units and multifamily and mixed use. And yes. 
do construction, we do acquisition, we do renovation. And beneath that, we've got private money, alternative money, A money, commercial money. So we know how to put it together. But we don't do plazas. We don't do uh, office buildings. Uh, we don't do uh, storage units, but really, okay. really residential and mixed use and whether it's a development or a construction or just a turnkey, it doesn't matter. Basically, most of the 80% of the assets are uh, the ones that investors work with. I really not many investors invest in the office or storage units or the other one, uh, the plazas, right? So these are the things that you you do not focus on. Yes. And, and we know how to finance the different strategies invest utilize along their journey. So whether it's a turnkey, assignments, uh, flips, buy, renovate, uh, refinance, uh, rent, uh, rent to own, uh, repositioning, like all of these mid-term rental, short-term rental, we know they're wow. Not every lender wants to do certain things, right? So we know how lenders think about these things and we've aligned ourselves behind the scene with the best lenders on the street who we consider investor friendly. So we know their rules inside out. We've got great relationships and concierge service. So, you know, that's that's the model we have right now. Very good, very good. Now that's that's a really interesting model. Like not many uh, brokers or brokerages do this. I have seen like many people work with investors, but they're then they're limited to like, maybe we'll only do uh, rehabs and like the burrs and the fix and flips, or somebody will only do fix and flips, or somebody will only do mixed use or right and they are like restricted with the kind of products that they have access to and the lenders that they have access to coming from a lender's point and then we'll also come to the repositioning how many lenders does streetwise as a mortgage company has access to like combining all of them together i'm gonna reframe the question because this is there is there is a misconception around the number of lenders brokers work with so you will go sometimes to broker websites and you say they say i work with a hundred and 40 lenders. I work with yes. 200 lenders. I yes. can tell you that that means nothing. Okay. Because yeah, and that's where that question was coming from. Yeah, that means nothing. Why doesn't that mean anything? It's because at the end of the day, this business that we're in, the mortgage business is similar to Walmart. Okay. So we're the Walmart. We choose who in terms of suppliers we work with and the better relationships we develop by bringing the right suppliers behind the scene to service our clients. Yes. The more we give our clients in deal negotiation and in rates and in an exception. So whether uh, I have access to 200 lenders, maybe. do I work with 200 lenders? Absolutely. I work with a handful of lenders that I believe are best aligned for real estate investors from a product standpoint, from a service standpoint, from a coverage standpoint. And they're probably like all together that who I actually believe I can fulfill 90% of the requests through 30. Yeah, that's a good number to have. Well, I believe as an investor, the product should work. The deal should get funded. The num If the numbers work, it should just get funded, right? It does not matter like if I'm getting it from ORBC oh, or I'm getting it from any alternate lender, right? If the numbers work, Work and uh, we see the the projections are really good. Uh, it, it'll just work. And I think most of the investors focus like this. And not every mortgage broker can help you understand the projections and the forecasting on how this will look like in the future. Right? Most people are focused now. I I, I love what you just said because it's a numbers game, right? Yes. If numbers work, great. If you're moving forward with your plan, great. But what's important is plan and not just look underneath our feet because sometimes people focus on closing the Karen deal without really understanding the implications on their future ability to borrow money, especially in the residential space. Let me give you an example. Someone who's focused on, I'm, I just want the best rate on the street to close this deal. Okay. Yes. Well, the best trade means that you may have to go with a 25-year amortization. It may mean that it's a fully closed mortgage that does not give you access to money down the road. If I put you in the best rate, lowest, lowest rate as an investor, we're actually hurting your future plans because one, now your monthly payment is higher. It's going to eat into your cash flow. It's going to impact your future deal. It's limiting your ability to take money out. So my point is, and again, you and I are talking the same language here, singing from the same sheet, planning, and it's not just 
most about the current deal? It's it's never about it. It's yeah. never about it. And that's where most of the people have kind of bad experiences or not so good experiences, right? Because now they are stuck. And when they have to move or break, that's when the pain happens. And that's when everything turns bad, yes. right? When the lesson is learned and yes. we are here to help inform investors of Absolutely. You know what they should watch for, open up possibilities for them. I don't want them to learn by, listen, mis- I don't like to use the word mistake. I like that to use the word lessons, but if I can save you thousands by helping yes. you understand what you're stepping into, plan better, get you towards your journey with less pain, why not? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. That's 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 what is required. And that's, that's how, what differentiates between the good and the not so good, I would say. Okay, so uh, do you invest in multifamily or mixed use yourself or uh, what kind of multifamily? So pure multifamily or some commercial also at the bottom like the mixed use, no? No, pure multifamily. Okay, any... mixed use. I mean, there is a benefit. So the reason I don't do mixed use is because the financing is a little bit more challenging for mixed use properties. Especially yes. if the commercial space is greater than 30% of the total footage or the rent from it is greater than 30 percent of the total rents i can't get it done with cmc so yes this is why i just stick with the plain vanilla any so now coming to the hottest topic i know where you're going with this yes so that is the hottest topic right the bank of canada rates they raised it to five percent like the bank of canada rate right but i still see cpi rising i still see uh the bond rates going up and there is still some fear coming out of like there may be another one that's coming in september no one knows uh, no one holds the crystal ball and i don't think bank of canada does as well and nobody knows if they will or they'll not but but what are your thoughts around the interest rates? All right. So like you said, nobody has the crystal ball and yeah. we're getting mixed messages from the yes. Bank of Canada itself, I will say. Yes. We called back in um, right after COVID. I think it was 2021, if my memory serves me right. Yes. There was a clear message that the interest rates are going to stay low for a long time. Yeah, till 2024. They like came on TV and like on news, they said it. Absolutely. Right. So that was the message. And that's the Bank of Canada that controls the rate top saying yeah. the rates are going to stay for a long, long time. Okay, great. Yes. Then all of a sudden, it's a panic time. It's panic. You know what? <laughs> Inflation. The, 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 raise, 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 raise. It's panic time. Fine. We understand that there is a tool that all central banks use called the monetary policy to limit money supply and the economy to control inflation. Fine. Yes. After some 400% increase in rates over a period of six months, the message was, at least the posture was, we're going to pause. And then the data didn't come through the way they expected it to come. And therefore, they're concerned. So they're obviously going to continue to do what they need to do to bring, to see this data come to a point where they need to see it. My problem is I'm not seeing the right hand talk to the left hand. Okay, so you've got the yes. bank raising the rates, and it is the tool that the central banks use. And I understand why it's being raised and inflation and all of that. Fine. On the other hand, we've got immigration coming in, 400,000 a year. These people are finding jobs, and the Bank of Canada wants to see unemployment go up. And we have the government spending money, people checks to help the yeah. situation. So how how are these two things aligned? That's where the challenge is. Yes. And so. Well, I- I- Bank of Canada raise again or not raise again based on their last statement and what the market is expecting looks like they're yes. going to raise again but at this point I tell investors listen will this continue forever no there is there is consensus that we are really really reaching the peak and it's now becoming very painful for many I know yes but it will start coming down sometime down the road when exactly nobody knows but yeah. it's likely due to 2024 but that timeline may shift so what can you do as an investor control what you can control yes can yes. you control what the Bank of Canada is going to do? And no, what can you control? If you're in pain right now, let's talk about ways to ease up that pain. Yes. Okay? Maybe through a debt restructure, through ways of generating more income. Sometimes it may have to mean you bring in an equity partner. Is Like I would leave selling as a last, 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 last resort because this yes. is 
market to sell in, right? Yes. That's control how things are for you right now. Position yourself so that you can benefit from the future rate reduction when the time comes. So what does that mean? One year fix, two year fix, because yes. Q2 2024, right? And we're July now, you're looking at July, August. Is it certain? No, you're gonna have to take a shot at this point, but I would say one or two years, if you're looking yes. beyond, beyond that, you're looking in at a very high of the cycle. And when things start to happen, you're not gonna be riding down that slide. So these are the things you can control. Yes, and I would, I would go with two because I think the rates are not coming down in 2024 anyways i think it'll start if it does by 2025 end and it's just my opinion like i'm not a not a financial expert or guru but yeah that's that's just uh some data points that i follow and i see because i see that we are in a rock and a stone situation right now there one side there is yes like you said the immigration is coming right and last year there were like one point around 1.2 million immigrants that got here right 400,000 from the outside but they also uh permanent residents like work permit people also became permanent residents right? Right, right yes so so that's there and so all those people are looking to buy because everybody who comes to canada it's like after like two years oh we want to buy a house we want to buy a house so real estate is the thing here right but yeah again and nobody can predict it but my opinion is like somewhere around the 2025 or 2026 like late 2025 or early 2026 is somewhere the rates may come down it even may not come down at that point and may go stretch a little further shifting target that's yes. okay and we yes. learned that seeing the actions by the bank of canada is a shifting target it's all dependent on how the data plays out but uh, yes. control what you can control at this point that's all i can yes say. yes so you, you cannot you we cannot really control bank of canada or nobody has the magic button to you know suddenly put it down although i want <laughs> to buy that magic yes. button I want yes that magic button. <laughs> absolutely no we, we everybody everybody does need it because i know a few people who are they're really struggling now especially if they their variable mortgage is not with any of the like the CIBCs or RBCs, right? But even though with them, their amortization is like close to 100 or even some cases like like 99 or 100 years. And I am fearing a time when it comes for renewal that needs to shrink back. That's a key point that you're yes. So there are the two types of variable rate mortgages, the adjustable that's been going up every time prime changes, right? So people will experience that payment increase right away. And yes. then the variable rates uh, with some of the banks that um, beneath the surface, the allocation of interest and principal changes. And the reason you're referring to a 90 year amortization is because with these folks, all of the payment is going towards interest. Interest. People paid in principle right now so in yes. order for payment to stay fixed the amortization extends but here's what's happening what's happening is that the regulators have been uh concerned at least putting messages out there that they're concerned about this situation and these amortizations are continuing to extend they're seeing it as a risk to the banks so there is yes. a lot of talk right now about yes how that should be handled. A lot of talk, whether it means that the banks have to increase their reserves because they're taking on a higher risk or whether it means that they have to reset some of these payments, it's unknown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Technically, uh, according to the contract, it resets at renewal, but there is talk to actually make something change before that. So it's not finalized, but there is a lot of talk about it with the, uh, you know, coming from the regulators. Austin. Yeah, also I, I read uh, in an article that what the banks also do and coming like in this scenario right the banks all what they do is like the amortization is increasing yes they're going to 90 90 but as soon as it is hitting the negative amortization or the that negative period which they call bigger rate yeah so they take that whatever the principal or interest is they tag it along the mortgage behind and then they even have the interest on that so they're having an interest on the interest uh when they when they move it to the back is that real like uh, how does that work i haven't heard about that approach uh yet but i know this is something that is being looked at at actively wow well, like we we are we are not sure what we are up to in like in the next 12 months or so <laughs> you know i know that those who are in adjustable rate mortgages are in pain but in my view they're the best they, they, they've been adjusting yes the journey. yes if someone's payment changes from here to there that's a payment shock like that is a shock 
So I hope yes. that will happen, but there is there is talk about how to handle the situation right now, and I don't know what the answer is going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like this article just came out yesterday, or maybe day before that I was reading, and the like you said, the regulators are looking at options because they are fearing something which either they're not telling, they know something, and they're not telling us. It smells like fear <laughs> for the banks, right? Yeah, the, 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 the regulators are, uh, we're seeing writing on the wall, let me put it this way. Yes. There is writing on the wall right now. Yes. That is coming from a place of concern about the defaults and the economy from the regulators. And of course, you know what's happening in the US. And the writing is that things are gonna tighten up. So I yes. know that Canada has been increasing the rates, but we're seeing even some banks become more conservative, both on the residential and commercial side when it comes to lending money. Yes, yes, very, very conservative. Yeah, so for us uh, advisors, it's taking us more uh, resourcefulness, let me put it this way, to actually make things happen for our clients because we have to go to the banks and say, you know what, we know you're concerned about this. We know you're, you know, you're all about risk management. Here is why you should feel comfortable about this file. Yes. And that's how we, we, we take what the clients tell us, we present it in a nice package to the lenders because we understand how they think, which sometimes the clients actually don't understand how the lenders think. With all good intentions, they go and talk about their exciting plans of, you know, renting this property Airbnb and doing this and doing that. And I am an investor myself and I get excited, but you have to think like a bank when you are yes. saving money. And that's yes. our role here. We keep up with everything that's happening behind the scene. And then we take your presenting, package it the right way so that we address all of their concerns so that we come back with a yes. And which is, which is the hardest part considering the times right now? Yes, yes. Because I've seen many lenders deny why there is more more and more gray that is showing up right now <laughs> All right. Now that is uh, this. This conversation was really, really informational, and I, I believe uh, all our audiences and viewers they they love what we talked about, especially on the mortgage and the interest rate sites. Now, uh, people, if you want to contact Dahlia, you can just head to streetwaysmortgages.com, and there you can fill out the form, and they will be in touch. They have a big team, fifteen people, as Dahlia said. Somebody will be with you. ASAP. Yes, we are happy to help right now to provide you with guidance to help you if you are experiencing cash flow pressures or if you're excited about the growth because there are opportunities still despite all of this. There are opportunities and you want to um, have a conversation about your financing roadmap to grow. We are here to guide you and help you regardless of where you are on your investment journey. And it doesn't have to be me. My team is actually better than me. They've been trained. Uh, they are in it every single day. But obviously, you know, I uh, oversee and I am happy to uh, answer any questions uh, regardless. Yes. Once again, I would like to ask you, uh, where are your locations? Like, where can you serve as a mortgage? professional uh, i know ontario saskatchewan and what else ontario saskatchewan nova scotia new brunswick and uh, alberta and bc we can do deals in edmonton but in terms of strong presence it's these six problems all right very good so there you have it Sorry, manitoba manitoba not edmonton manitoba yeah manitoba all right so now people you have it and if you want to connect uh, with the team, just head to streetwisemortgages.com. And when we release this episode, we'll also be putting the social handles to follow Streetwise Mortgages on all the social handles that they have. And you can follow and connect with them through that. So we would like to thank you, Dahlia, for coming us and enlightening us with her wisdom and experience of 13 plus years in the mortgage industry. Thank you very much. It was really a nice conversation to have. Harsh, my, my pleasure. And thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Wow.